Hi, <laughs> and welcome to Picture Book Pilot to Project using daily read alouds with middle school students. My name is Rebecca Weinkoop, and I am currently the teacher librarian at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School in Seattle, Washington. We are in year four of our picture book project, and I'm going to share a little bit with you today about how we started the program, where it came from, what we're doing now, and maybe some tips or tricks for how you might start or consider read alouds with your students uh, in a K through 12 setting. I'm going to go ahead and start with a little bit of what has come to define the foundation of our daily read alouds program. Goldie Muhammad has written a book called Cultivating Genius, an equity framework for culturally and historically responsive literacy. And in this book, she talks about a couple of different um, things, five in fact, five pursuits. And it's these five pursuits that have really come to define the work that we're doing and why we're doing it. So we'll start with just listening to Goldie Muhammad telling us a little bit about these five pursuits. So Dr. Muhammad, um, let's start by, you know, for, for folks who aren't that familiar um, with your framework. So your framework for culturally and historically responsive literacy um, really focuses on four, four learning pursuits. So um, identity, intellect, criticality, um, and skills. Now, for folks who aren't familiar, can you maybe give us an overview of, of what those mean and how does this approach differ from how teachers have traditionally been, been taught to, uh, to, to teach? Yeah, so, you know, as I was studying these Black literary societies throughout the 1800s, I really wanted to know what were some of the learning goals that they had when it comes to literacy learning, but also for educational learning, not just thinking about like English language arts or literature. I also thought about mathematics and science and history. And so when I was studying the historical archives, like um, uh, public addresses that they had given during that time, old newspapers that they had published in, I came to an understanding that they essentially had these four major goals for learning and they called their learning goals pursuits. And so they did not call them learning standards because I found that learning standards comes more from Eurocentricity. It's a word that sort of like seeped in whiteness. It wasn't a word that communities of color used to describe their learning goals. And so of the four goals, the first was identity development. I, I noticed that every time they were reading and writing and thinking and learning, they were making sense of who they are, who they were, who they weren't, who they wanted and desired to be. You know, so all the complexity that comes, uh, comes with identity, they were making sense of their lives. And they were also learning about the lives of other people. They would read and learn from literature from all over the world, including China. And so they didn't just, they didn't just uh, focus on themselves, but they wanted to learn about other people who were different than them as well. And then the second goal or pursuit that they had was skills. They were trying to gain the skills and the proficiencies uh, for mathematics, for science, for all the different content areas, right? And so uh, like comprehension, I mean, things that we would normally see like in a common core state standard today. The third pursuit is intellectualism. All learning was connected to action. That's the difference that I describe in the book from knowledge to intellectualism. The difference is that one is more action oriented, like intellectualism. And so as they were reading and writing and thinking and learning, they were becoming smarter about new ideals and concepts and people and places and things. They weren't just learning to develop skills alone. And the fourth uh, pursuit that they had was with criticality. Now, this was an interesting one. I originally named it, which a lot of people don't know, print authority, because it was like they were learning, they would see themselves with identity, they would learn the skills with skills, they would learn the intellectualism, and they would use it to put their own critique and interrogate it to get to gain authority of the text. 
right? Um, you know, we have authority of something when we know it, when we know it well enough where we can debate on it and where we can critique it. You can't just stand in a room talking about any topic if you don't have any knowledge. And you need the identity and the skills to get to that knowledge. So you can see how they were all connected. But criticality went a little further. Criticality was an understanding of equity, oppression, anti-racism. Um, it was helping them to understand issues of marginalization, exploitation, and representation. And a criticality, I'll just lastly add, it was something that helped them to, in their own words, I'm, I'm quoting here, it helped them to be able to discern between truth and falsehood at a glance. That was one of their major purposes for education. And this is something that can be useful for all students. And if I added a fifth pursuit, it would be joy. Because I noticed that even in the most turmoil of conditions and harshest and oppressive and racist times, they still loved each other and was able to uh, cultivate joy with each other, which is very remarkable. Um, because when you have a lot of pain and struggle and everything is about resistance, to then say, you know what, we're going we're gonna to have joy. That's a beautiful, remarkable, humane kind of quality. And so the difference, um, to respond to your second question, when we take a look at those, let's say, five pursuits, if we added joy, compared to what we see in schools and classrooms, schools and classrooms are largely solely or mostly pushing skills. Everything is about skill development. And it's not as much, unless you have very unique classroom spaces, about application. Even our Common Core state standards are grounded in skill development. We don't have uh, adopted equity standards, identity standards, criticality standards, and how lovely it would be if we did, right? And so that's the difference. Our system is really, um, from the 1600s to today, we are still pushing skills, 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 uh, evaluating teachers on their ability to teach the skills, assessing skills, and that's what I'm trying to come away from, be more comprehensive and be more excellent. Thanks to Dr. Muhammad for sharing those thoughts. Um, it's it's kind of surprising, so, quite Dr. frankly, Muhammad, um, when- Let's start by, you know, for, for folks- When you've been working on something for a couple of years, we started this program in 2018, and to be working on it for a couple of years and then have a scholar come forward and um, name and articulate what kind of you had felt in your gut, what, what we knew from practice and from working with students, um, we knew. And I didn't have the capacity or the experience to name it, nor have I done the research that Dr. Muhammad does to name it in the way that she does. And so just, again, to reiterate that, that even though we didn't begin there, the five foundational pursuits that Dr. Mohammed outlines are exactly what we were trying to get at and what we continue to try to reach for with our read aloud, our daily read aloud program in our middle school, with identity being the first to be able to make sense of our lives and the lives of those around us. The diversity of experience and culture in our read alouds is really intentional. We know that in publishing that our BIPOC authors, um, our LGBTQIA plus authors, those stories are, are just now starting to be told in an authentic way and that we need to make space for that because it's reflective of our student body and the students that we serve. And it gives our students who maybe um, who live in the, the mainstream mode gives them an opportunity um, to share that experience with someone else. In addition, uh, skills, skills across all content areas. We read through math, science, social studies, and language arts. Our books contain all of those topics, but they're not limited to those disciplines. And so math might be reading about a social studies topic and science might be reading about um, 
another a story about um a poet and you cross those boundaries and begin to help students make critical connections between the different disciplines that they're studying. Intellectualism, that all learning is connected to action, focused on new ideas and concepts. This idea that we make meaning of the world around us and that, that doing this through story and through literary societies um, isn't new. And unfortunately, it's something that's been abandoned and that we're trying to bring back to the lives of our students, that, that we are building community through story and allowing students an opportunity to engage in this intellectual pursuit. Criticality, or what she originally called print authority, this expertise on something, and that, that we can begin to understand things like equity and oppression and representation and marginalization through the stories that are being told in own voices is really powerful. And, and last but not least, joy. This, this idea that story brings joy and shared words bring joy and comfort. And it doesn't happen with every book, but there are every week stories of students or teachers that are reading these books in class that come to me and say, I loved this book because we cheered at the end of this book because, and they're really finding across all disciplines and every single day, students are, are being able to experience joy through this read aloud program. We did start in 2018. Um, I did not do this on my own. Uh, first thought colleagues were Tuesday Chambers, Stacia Bell and Marion Royal. Um, Tuesday and Stacia are both still in Seattle Public Schools with me and Marion has moved to another district. But we really started with this as a pilot. We called it our picture book pilot. And the picture book pilot was intended to allow us the opportunity to think about how we could bring story back to our students, how we could provide um, access to experiences other than their own in small snippets, but across all disciplines. Um, in addition, I absolutely have to stop and make sure I say, a huge thank you and shout out to the staff at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School from our administration to all of our staff who have committed to this project and continue to support this in the lives of their students every day. It absolutely it could not happen without their support and their commitment. So just to give you a little bit of a background about what we are talking about, and where this came from and what this looks like. In 2018, we first launched this project at Eagle Staff. For us, this was one book read aloud every day. And I was borrowing multiple copies of three different text sets every week from across our district of over 100 school libraries. And it was a huge project. And um, I'll be honest, starting in year two in 2019, I was trying to figure out how I was gonna continue to manage that on top of my teaching load on you know, making sure teachers had what they need in their classes and that students had the books that they needed. And um, we launched in the second year, made a few improvements. And then again, in March of 2020, as with everyone else, everything kind of shut down because of COVID and we had to stop and think about what, what will our read aloud program look like? Our um, principal um, is Dr. Marnie Campbell. And she was adamant that these read aloud's needed to continue to be a part of our students' lives. And I was so grateful for her continued support and vision in this process. Um, when we started in 2020, in the fall of 2020 with remote learning, um, our schedule was very different and we had less face-to-face -face time with students trying to monitor their access and their use of technology, um, or at least limit that exposure to an extent that you know we feared it might might do more harm than good. And so what we did is we moved our read aloud to once a week, every week through our advocate program. And um, what that allowed us to do was to record, pre-record video read alouds with mostly new staff and a handful of students as well who helped read those books. And that was a really uh, unique and, and fantastic way to continue to build community and to get, continue to know, get to know each other even when we couldn't be together. That did lead us to 
um, some big changes for the 2021-2022 school year. We're um, almost most of the way through that school year now. We return to our daily read alouds across all four disciplines, core disciplines, and we moved to a more streamlined process, which I'm going to be able to share with you now. We started, we did start with uh, common goal and, and buy-in and wanted to kind of identify some of the core reasons we're doing this. You know, we come back to identity and skills and intellectualism and criticality and joy. And those, those are absolutely the best descriptors of why we do this with our students. Um, but when we started out, we had to just begin by saying that it creates a space for intellectual and emotional connection, bringing us together through shared story, words and ideas, um, knowing that research shows that, you know, it's a time, middle school is a time when teens and tweens, um, their life is full of crazy. And it's one way to have a place of rest, of being, um, something they can count on each day. And so we, we used this as our core, our foundation for how we were going to build buy-in across, again, math, science, social studies, and language arts. Math and science, um, we just have amazing educators in our school. And even though there were a few um, who didn't take to it right away, it, you know, it took, took some time to understand what was going to happen. So in its current iteration, we wanted to remove as many barriers for teachers and students as possible. And so we start with building our text sets, our text sets that best represent our students and their lived experiences, build connections across content areas and ensure representation. And so here's an example of our read aloud calendar for March 2022. You can see on the left hand side, it identifies the theme first and the subject area that we'll be reading the books that week. And then the books are the co covers of the books for each day. One of the things that un unique too about this is that not only do teachers have access to this calendar, but they also, each one of these books is a link to our shared folder that has access to the books that the teachers need and links to our Libby or OverDrive accounts that they're using to borrow the books to ensure that we maintain uh, copyright compliance and also honor the authorship of the authors and illustrators who've created these amazing books. So the steps that we've taken to provide structure are a predictable schedule. It's a rotation. It goes in the exact same order every four weeks. Access to materials, we talked about a centralized location for those materials. The honor of authorship and copyright, our partnership with Seattle Public Library allows us to, each teacher has an e-card, that's not their own personal e-card, so they're borrowing books on that card. To remove all barriers, I'll talk a little bit about calendar invites and, and structure for file sharing that we used. Remaining flexible, understanding that, you know, a, a standardized testing schedule will force us to abandon a week, for example, or move things around a little bit. Um, and so just being willing and ready to adjust when necessary. And then last but not least, to find joy. Uh, we found early on that a lot of the reticence that our teachers had was just a lack of comfort with reading a picture book. If um, you've never read picture books with middle school students, it takes a little bit of guts, right? And a whole lot of, of bravery to, to read a story in a way that's going to captivate them. And, and we all know that from having done read alouds with students that it can be a little challenging because you might get a little bit of pushback, but to persist and to also provide support and structure. So we offered PD on, on read aloud strategies and we continue to support our classroom teachers as they engaged in this process um, outside of many of their comfort zones. Again, phenomenal stuff. So the predictable schedule and access, we talked about how the calendar is used, but then on the right hand side, you can see this is a shared folder. And not only does it have the calendars that are there, but it also has the original presentation I did at the beginning of the year that explains why we're doing this and how we're doing this and shows teachers how to use Libby, their e-card access to the digital copies of these books. And then provides um, a very simple and very clear structure month to month for teachers to be able to follow. 
In addition, um, we have this amazing partnership that we know is very valuable for teachers to be able to keep your personal life and your professional life separate. We've had institutional public library cards in the past. This is an e-card that every one of our staff members across the entire district gets in an incredible library link partnership with Seattle Public Libraries. And what that allows us to do is to honor the authorship and to comply with copyright law and make sure that every teacher who's reading a book aloud in class has borrowed that book from the public library in an electronic format as we go through the year. We're gonna go ahead and skip that video. This video is available um, on our library's YouTube page if you're interested in learning how to access Libby or how we do that in our school district. It, as part of our attempt to remove barriers for teachers, we I do a weekly invite to the teachers. You can see on the left hand side is a science read aloud invite for the week of April 4th. It gives them a previous reminder that the night before at five o'clock that they have a read aloud coming the next day. And then in the notes of the email, it gives them access directly to that folder and a reminder about borrowing those books on Libby to remain compliant and honor amazing authors. In Finding Joy, we recognize that we're not gonna hit everything every time on the mark and that we're going to need to elicit feedback, solicit feedback from both our students and our teachers to make sure that, that we're, we're getting to where we need to be. And so we do an annual survey this is, these are just a couple of examples of staff responses. Uh, 4.27 out of five is the average um, scale rating of how you would rate the pic picture book pilot. So out of 64 responses, which is a very high response rate for our staff, um, almost four and a half percent, 4.5 stars, quite frankly, um, out of five is a great place to be for how we would rate this. Um, some of their responses were great. Students love the break. I think it helped make math, <gasps> math, a little less scary. The positive message about perseverance was helpful as well. I've been impressed with students making big leaps in connection to their own lives and the books or more complex themes than when we have addressed them in class. I just love how within the first three pages, everyone calms down and listens, or at least is quiet. It's a great way to start class and get kids to code switch into academics. I brought one from home and read it on a day we weren't assigned. It was, uh, was related to perseverance and, mind, and growth mindset. So we saw that teachers were finding the value of starting the class this way, um, even connecting it to the learning that they're doing in class and bringing in additional picture books, which is really a fantastic thing. I'm gonna share with you just a very short video clip of some students this year who were um, taking turns reading the book, Ugly Fish in our week of quirky read alouds. These are eighth graders. Two days later, two other fish appeared in the book. We asked why he named Spotty Fish. The new fish said, what's your name? I am Ugly Fish, said Ugly Fish. Just a super cute opportunity for students to engage in this process. Regularly ask for students to read aloud. And I know a lot of teachers really appreciate that students engage in that process. Two days later, two other fish appeared in the book. So in addition to teacher feedback, we also have continued to ask for student feedback. And for student feedback, we um, ask them, how would you rate this experience of having read alouds every day? And you know, it's lower than the teachers is at 3.8. We're still well above um, halfway on that five point rating. But some of the things that they've said, it makes my day. I like the chill start to class. Um, it gives everyone a small break to relax before having to focus on classwork. Um, I like the message. Good pictures makes my day. I have something to laugh about throughout the day. It's funny and fun to listen and look at the pictures. Uh, one student says, I really like how the stories brought the whole class together and kind of settled us down at the beginning of class rather than having to dive right back into schoolwork. It was just a nice transition that made us all laugh and usually feel good. Um, I love how every book was a new lesson and how it's really relaxing. I wish there could be longer stories. So we found 
over time that one, as soon as we adjusted to this, that um, and understood that this could be a moment, a shared experience, and that, there, that you were going to connect to different books in different ways, we had a lot of positive feedback from students. I thought that it might be worth sharing our text set themes for 2021-2022 because we have six of the eighth grade and we've built this project over four years now. Um, this is the first year that I have been repeating some titles. Of course, I occasionally make a mistake and repeat anyways. Um, and the thing that, that I love the most is when students stop and they say, hey, we read that last year. And you're like, yes, you remember, we read that last year. That's a pretty amazing thing to have happen, even though I know they're frustrated because they I think they've already read it and it's not valuable to hear it again. Um, but you can see that they the themes can, can range from things like open hearts and community and home and balance to just for giggles. Um, dream big, just winter, like that anticipation right before break of, uh, before the winter break of, of being home and, and the possibility of snow. Um, even in Seattle, we get excited about that. Uh, that's kind of a great way to kind of focus and challenge our excitement or quite frankly, sometimes our fear about going home for the holidays. Classics and favorites, food and pets are indigenous authors that, um, we love to hear from amazing stories of gender identity and cultural heritage, things that are quirky, kindness and acceptance. These are universal things that people feel and experience. And we want our students to have a safe and guided way to, to think about these things and to engage in conversation about that as they go through middle school. So I've covered a lot. This is our picture book project. We started as a picture book pilot. And now that we're doing it every year, it's no longer in the pilot phase. We are in the project phase and we continue to build community through story each and every day at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School. I hope that there were some things that maybe were helpful from the nuts and bolts of how we make this successful, um, accessible to teachers and staff how we share this with other members of our community. One of the things that our principal has done since we started this program is for open house and for um, curriculum night, she has opened most of those with a read aloud. She grabs a book from our text sets and she reads them with family, families and explains the importance and the purpose of the read aloud for students, those five uh, pursuits that Dr. Muhammad mentioned, identity, skills, intellectualism, criticality, and joy are really at the core of why we do this work with students, of why we've brought picture books into the classroom with middle school students. And um, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share it with you, to tell you about some of the things we've done to try and make it better more accessible, um, as meaningful, and as relevant for our students as possible. I did mention at the beginning that you can, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. If you're curious to see what other kinds of things are happening at Eagle Staff, I'm available. My personal email is here, Mrs. Winecoop at gmail.com. If you'd like to follow our YouTube channel, you can see what's there as well. Um, but I have, again, really enjoyed the opportunity to share this project with you. I'm grateful to our administration, to our staff, to my thought partners that helped us at the very, very beginning and who continue to provide support to Tuesday Chambers and Stacia Bell. I am thrilled that the potential exists for picture books to begin to become a part of even more middle school students' lives as we move forward. Real quick shout out to Slides Mania. I did not make these slides all on my own. Um, if you haven't used Slides Mania, it's a pretty fantastic way to pump up your presentations. So again, thank you so much for taking the time. 
If you made it all the way to the end, please feel free to reach out with any questions. And I will, of course, provide a link to this presentation so that you can follow through at your own pace. Thank you.